me just uh, finish getting the cockpit all set up here. Okay, welcome to Flight Experience Adelaide, Mark. Uh, right now we're sitting on runway uh, 16 at uh, Melbourne Tullamarine uh, Airport mm -hmm. in a fully loaded 737. It's not configured for takeoff yet, so we're going to configure the cockpit for takeoff. The engines are started, and we're just sitting here idling on the ground. Yep. So what we have here is our flight and trim balance sheet. So on this sheet here, what we have is we have a whole range of information that is useful for the crew in doing a flight from, let's say, Adelaide to Melbourne. So it tells them the amount of fuel they'll be using. These are all in kilograms. It will tell them the alternate airports. So alternate summary, it tells you how far away you are from an alternate airport. Your weights, tells you a bit about the weather. It tells you all the waypoints we'll be flying and when we need to start descending. And then what it also tells us is the weather briefings and the main flight plan, which is what we want here. So this is a breakdown of the flight plan. What we have here is what it says here. It tells who, the, who it was briefed for, which is Flight Experience 556, which is our flight here. And it tells us all our waypoints and the altitude we're going to be flying at. So we're going to be flying at flight level 360. But before we do that, we're going to be doing some circuits here at, here at Melbourne, yep. okay? So I'm going to give you a bit, uh, an, ace, an overview of the cockpit here. So this here is your flight control column. This is used to steer the aircraft. So to turn the aircraft to the left, you move the control column to the left. To turn the aircraft to the right, you move the control column to the right. Uh, that controls this type of motion with the wings, as you've probably seen on flight sim. Yep. The other thing we use the flight control column for is the vertical mo movement of the nose. So to get the nose to pitch up and climb or go higher, we pull the stick back Sound towards... Like that. Yep, you want to pull it back nice and firmly to about there. And then to lower the nose, you're going to push it forward to lower the nose. So pretty pretty clear with that. Yep. On the left-hand side there, you have a tiller wheel. That tiller wheel is responsible for steering the nose of the aircraft whilst we're on the ground. So that's how you get from uh, typically the gate, which is over there, all the way to the runway. Yep. And essentially, it's a very sensitive device. Um, if you move it towards you, it turns the aircraft nose to the left. Okay. If you push it away from you, it pushes it to the right. We shouldn't need to use it too much today because we're already pretty much ready to go on the runway. Um, but that's what it does. The same thing is those rudder pedals down by your feet there. So you feel yep. me giving them a push? Yep. They control the big vertical stabiliser on the back of the aircraft. So essentially that big vertical fin uh, does the same as a tiller wheel, but we use it to keep us aligned in the runway because it's less sensitive and requires a little bit more movement. So happy with that? Yep. Cool. Moving in into the centre pedestal here, you've got a throttle quadrant here. So if you move it forward, it will increase power. And if you, uh, you just don't want to do that right now. Oh yeah, yep. you're spawning up. That's it, and if you bring it back, it brings it back down to idle, as you can see. If you look on your engine display, you'll see when you move the power up, you'll see a little trend line will come up, so the engine will actually come up and stop there. Oh, okay. So it's a trend line. It can go more than that. You just saw it for yourself, but if we want to select a certain amount of power, that's how we go about doing so. Cool. On top, we have two throttle reverses. Uh, they help slow the aircraft down once we land. They go up and back, as, as you can see, like that, and a bit further. So that area is full reverse. Fantastic. This here is the flap lever, so this is responsible for bringing out the big uh, flaps at the end of the edge of the wings, So, and that's how you bring them down. You got a gate at 1 and 15, um, so it's like a little upside down V. Just sort of stops you going too far. Yep, correct. And we'll set them at 5 for takeoff. Fantastic. On the side here, you see these little wheels that will spin around a lot. They're called the trim wheels. Uh, you'll notice at different stages during the flight that, oh gee, the control column is really heavy. And that's because you're fully deflecting that control surface to be able to hold the nose up. What the trim wheel does is it takes the weight out and it keeps it in balance to where you've set the, the stabiliser position. Here is a speed brake lever. Uh, essentially the way it works is you lift the lever up and you, you pull it back to arm it, like so. That's it. Yep. And that brings the big panels on top of the wings out. So it allows the aircraft to stay sitting so on the runway. Go like that. Yeah, but we don't take it all the way back. We, we, we just only, arm it we like only that. To arm it. It's fully automatic. Cool. Moving out through the cockpit here, we have our landing gear lever, so this brings the wheels up into the aircraft. Have a go yourself. That's it. This here is our rejected uh, auto brake and anti-skid device. It has two functions. It has like an ABS braking system of your car. Helps the aircraft slow down without locking up the wheels. Yep. Uh, that's the anti-skid function. However, the auto braking system is a little bit different. The auto braking system is a system which automatically will apply a certain amount of brake 
power to the, the brakes to slow the aircraft down. So it reduces the wear and tear on the wheels and the brake pads because you, like trucks, you, you go through them a lot if you use your yeah. brakes. This doesn't have an exhaust brake as such, so uh, it's a little bit harder to slow down. And you can't put a retarder on it because all the weight on an aircraft yeah. is too heavy. So for takeoff, we have a setting RTO, which stands for rejected takeoff. So if we need to re abort our takeoff for any reason whatsoever, once the throttle is brung to idle and, and um, the reverse is up, what it does is it applies maximum braking power to the brakes. Moving over to your primary flight display here, uh, when I can find my, my pointer. You have a couple of things we'll talk about. On the left here, you have your airspeed. shows you how fast you're going. On your right, you have your altimeter. So this shows you how high above the ground uh, we are. Right now it says 400 feet because that's Melbourne Airport's elevation. So what we want to do is we want to bring our Q&H down to it says zero. So what I want you to do is with this little dial here, here, yeah, I want you to turn that to the left to set the Q&H to 999 hectopascals. That's it. And then you'll see we're just above the ground there. Yep. So now we're reading the same pressure on both sides and it matches. So right now we're 60 feet above the ground, which is a little bit higher. Um, Usually the 737 Scott puts about 20 to 30 feet above the ground, but it will do for the purposes of what we're doing. Over here is a navigation display. I'm going to come back and talk about this one here, uh, only because we will set up the flight management computer, and I'll show you what will come up on the, the map nav display. Coming back to the primary flight display, you see these two little upside down L's. They represent the wings of the aircraft. Blue represents the sky, brown represents the ground, and each little line represents a certain degree of pitch above the horizon, so two and a half degrees of pitch per line. Okay, yep. So if you have it at the 10 and the blue, that means you, compared to the horizon, the nose is going to be pointing 10 degrees, 10 degrees above up. and vice versa. I like to remember it as houses get smaller, houses get bigger. <laughs> so on the top, we have an angle of bank indicator. shows us how steeply we're turning in 10 degree intervals, 10, 20 and 30. And 30 degrees is the maximum amount of bank we want to use in a turn for passenger comfort. However, the aircraft is quite capable to do more if we need to. This is the autopilot. Um, we'll actually use a fair amount of it today, only because uh, on a sector flight, that's what a majority of a flight is done, is done on autopilot. I'll show you how it works. We have three functions. We have an altitude hold function, a heading hold function, and an airspeed holding function. Um, however, we can, we can pair our heading function to our flight management computer so it follows a certain route or whatever we program yep. into it. Overhead panel, there's quite a lot going on up here, as you can probably tell. Um, so everything is sort of set into its position of where it's used the most. So the instruments we use the most, uh, the least, sorry, are at the back of the aircraft. The Arderos, which are here. And then coming down the left of the, uh, the overhead panel, you have all your fuel control switches and some hydraulics. And then you have uh, electrical systems all through here and generators, passenger signs, anti-icing, hydraulics, very important for a plane. And what you have here is aircraft pressurisation. Yeah. Uh, what we have at the front here is the light, all the lighting sw switches. And the reason they're at the front, and engine starting switches, I should say, uh, the reason they're at the front is because we use those switches the most. So we want to be able to reach them pretty quickly. Or sort of it's, there, yeah. it's about being um, ergonomic. In the middle here, we have a couple of different radio panels in the middle. So here we have two VHF communication radios. Similar to a UHF, but it works in the uh, VHF band instead of the UHF band and two VHF navigation radios. So we use these radios to tune like an ILS. Okay. Or we use these radios to help land an aircraft at an airport or find an airport. We have a transponder, which uh, allows air traffic control to tell who we are in the sky compared to everyone else. Yep. And we have two ADFs, which is another navigation uh, tool we can use to help find us, which stands for Automatic Direction Finder. We can tune certain beacons on the ground okay. that will tell us where it is. So it works in the AM band. So if you wanted to, we could tune you know, 891 on here and we could listen to the wa the radio. Ah, oh, there we go. When I get there. So, for example, we could tune 891 and theoretically we could actually listen to the radio if oh, we okay. wanted to. <laughs> so, not that we do ever do. Um, and they're slowly being phased out. We don't really yeah. use them anymore. They're very outdated. So, cool. That's the basic overview of, uh, of the controls of the aircraft. So, what we're going to talk about now is the flight management computer here, which is this computer here. You have one on your side, but the screen is US at the moment. I so think that was broken last time. I yeah. Think. Got to get apart from New Zealand, except can't get much over at the moment. Um, and they don't make the same one anymore, so the SIM needs to be actually upgraded, upgraded a little bit. before we can get the new <coughs> unit. 
We'll give it a go, though. So, see where it says nose wheel steering. If you want to flick that little guard open. Oh, this one here? Yeah, we've changed the function of that switch to the program up to the FMC. So, turn that to the left. And then push it back in. And put the guard back down. Sometimes it comes back on. Oh, okay. Um, it's very intermittent, but they are paired together anyway, so whatever you do on this screen would actually be done on this screen as well. Sometimes it comes on during the flight. But what I'll get you to do is I'll show you how it works. So the first thing we want to do is we want to enter the position on the flight management computer so it can figure out where we are. So if you want, I'll get you to lean over here in a second and I'll read out all the flight plan and stuff to you. Cool, so what I want you to do is I want you to type in this little keyboard, YMML. That's it, and then you want to press it in that top box there. That one there. Uh, one below. So what it's doing is that puts its GPS coordinate into the system. And then what we do is we copy it and we set the inertial referencing position. What that does is that lets the aircraft know where its position is compared to everywhere else in the globe. Yep. And it gives it a starting point. Next thing we want to do is we want to go to route. And we want to put it in the origin. Origin. And then we want to type in Adelaide, which is Yankee Papa yeah. Alpha Delta. P's on the left there. Left column. Just there. Oh. AD. And then we want to put it in DEST for destination. The next thing we want to do is we want to set our arrival and departure runway. So you're going to press runway cell. That's that one. And press, press 1-6. One 1-6, six. One six, that's that one. And then runway on the other side. So that's... And that we're one. expecting to land on runway 2-3. Two 2-3. Three. Two three. Then you want to press activate. Oh, no you don't. I'm lying. So now what we want to do is we want to... This is where we want to put our route in. Okay. So what we want to do is we have a flight plan here and we have a certain amount of departures. So we want to go to Nevis. So type Nevis in. N-E-V. Uh, where are we? N-E-V. I-S. I-S. Press 2. Yep. So that's the first waypoint. And if you look on your map now, you see a waypoint called Nevis actually pops up on your primary flight display. Sorry, on your nav display. And it's a little bit further out. It's about... Oh, and it loads up. It's, a, it's about 80 nautical miles away from the airport. So then what we want to do is we want to put the rest of the, the wet in. So we want to go to... What we want to do is we want to write Drina. So D. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Want to type in another waypoint in. D R. Yep. I N A. And press it under Nevis. So Drina is uh, a waypoint, which is ex actually the ex Alexandrina Lake. Which oh, is Lake a Alexandrina. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that's what it's known as as a waypoint is Drina because it's shortened. Yep. We shorten all our waypoints, so that's that physical reference on the ground. And since we're flying on what's called a high altitude airway. We actually want to plug in this little airway here. So where it says H345, uh, that's like a, a, yeah, a, highway, like a highway, but in the sky. So yeah. you, know, you know you have the A1 so or yeah, Stuart like Highway. Princess or, Highway or whatever that exactly. So, so in the air, too. we have pre-designated ones, and sometimes they're only one way, or they're both ways. It can be a whole different range of them. But today we're flying on the, H, the designated H345. So type in... So you put in the H. H345. That's it. And then what you want to do is, you see how it says VIA in these boxes? Yep. So this is where you'd put it. You want to put it in the second one. So that one there. Yep. And then you want to retype in Drina. So D. Oh, that's oh. a H, so just press clear. So clear. N O. And then back in this little box here. Cool. Now we want to go to the next page. And we want to type in the rest of it. So Drina. And we're going to be doing a Drina 9 Zulu arrival, allegedly. I say BS. What we're going to go do is we'll fly it to a, a waypoint called uh, Mopri. Oh, actually, no, we press departure. Oh, departure. Yep. Now we want to set our arrivals and departures. Oh, okay. So, um, out of an airport. So, when you're driving on the road, you pretty much only have the choice to follow one way in Adelaide to get to where you want to go or a yep. couple of different ways. What we have in aviation is we have what are called SIDs and STARS. SID is a standard instrument departure, and a STAR is a standard arrival route. So these are like highways to get out of an airport, specific highways. And since there are certain spatial requirements of an aircraft, they often have to take them off at different times to get them onto oh, okay. the way they're going. 
Um, and it allows more standardised flow and more efficiency in the air traffic control network. You don't get congested like you do on Port Rush Road or something like that because the aircraft are constantly moving on these predefined routes, which are usually one way. Yep. So what we want to do is we want to press departure. And then what we want to do is we want to press runway 16 because we'll be departing from runway 16. That's that one. The top one. And that gives us a list of all the waypoints eligible for okay. this runway. We want to be doing a never six. Do you see that on the screen here? I don't. So you so want to go to the next page. So next page. There's a never seven. Never seven. That, that will do. It's just because it's updated. So what that does is that if you look back at your map, that brings up all the little waypoints in between here and Nevis. Oh, okay. And that's the way we would follow when we're going off. But since we're doing a circuit first, we will do a little bit different. Yep. Now what we want to do is we want to go route. And then we want to do is we want to select our arrival into Adelaide. We want to load our arrival. So we go arrival. The bottom one. That's it. And now we want to, what we want to do is we want to do uh, an ILS Zulu into runway 23. So that's that one. Yep. And we want to select all the arrival options. So you see how we've got a 9 Zulu here? Yep. And there's 9A, 9V, and there should be a 9Z. 9Z. They've got different designators because they're for different aircraft. Oh, okay. So, or they're slightly different waypoints. So there are certain ways you can enter into an arrival. So there are three points, but, and if you, there will be a designator A, V, and Z, just depending on where you are compared to the rest of the airport. Yep. And that's to avoid planes coming in like this. So there'll be one over here, one over here, and one in the middle. So they all sort of funnel in. So we want to select Adrena 9 Zulu arrival. So, so that's that one. Yep. And then go to route. And you'll see a couple of dis route discontinuities. Discontinuity. Discontinuities. Um, just because we haven't uh, activated the approaches yet. But all the rest is good to go. So now you want to press activate and execute, which is that green and button that just lit up. Execute that one. Yep. So now the route's confirmed. If you look at your map, you'll see a little um, solid okay, magenta so line. Solid line now. Yep. You want to go perf, performance. And we want to enter all our weight and balances in. So zero fuel weight. You just want to press the button and it will automatically load uh, uh, down the bottom. Yep. Sorry, in the middle. There you are. That one. Yep, so we've got a uh, zero fuel weight of 41 tonnes and a gross weight of 49 tonnes, so we're a bit lighter today. Yep. We've got 2.5 tonnes of reserve, so you have to enter that in, so 2.5. So it's 2.5. Yep, into reserves stock there. So that's... Ch -ch -ch -ch. And you want to, for our cost index, you want to write about 100. So put 100. It's about 100 kilos a minute that we're burning. Just up there. Cool. And that gives us our altitude and our restrictive altitude. So now we want to type in our cruising altitude, which will be flight level 360. So you're going to write 360 there. And put a zero in the middle and then to the top. And it will automatically set it to flight level 360. Execute it. Now the next pages are all set up because they're a little bit more complex. This is your N1 limit pages. Essentially, this sets the power of the engines before takeoff. It limits how much power goes into the engine so that That's you're not... Uh, Over-stressing the parts, less wear and tear. Like a guy I worked with, he liked to start the uh, truck in the morning and, and instead of just letting it idle and warm, warm up, up, he'd just get in there and start running. Not a good idea with diesels. <laughs> yeah, the truck ended up in uh, back at the dealer for about 10 years because they were fighting over who was going to fix the yeah. engine. <laughs> yeah, and it's the same with aviation. Um, if we've got a longer runway we might choose to reduce our t total power when we take off. Yep. If we've got a shorter runway, more power. If it's a hotter day, we want more power. More power, All, yep. So many variables, right? So what we want to do is we wanna, we've got a pretty long runway at Melbourne, so we're going to use uh, setting takeoff one and climb one. So on takeoff, it's going to give us uh, a thrust percentage of 86.7. And for the climb, 86.7. So I'm yep. um, pretty comfortable for you. We want to use flaps five and a centre of gravity. So the aircraft wants to know how many... Uh, where it weighs and where it's going to be yep. equal. That's a pretty standard flap setting pretty much, isn't it? Yeah, so the only reason we'd use anything more, the limit is 15. Any more and you're getting too much drag and it's actually reducing your, your performance. performance yep. So five is very standard. So the first setting is the, the front edge leading flaps and five starts to bring out the back a little bit. 15 yep. brings it a little bit more and it's typically more used in a very shorter runway situation or a touch yep. and go. Yep. Cool. Um, so what we want to do is we then enter in our V speeds. So these uh, tell us when we actually want to take off. Yep. V1 is the point we can no longer commit to a takeoff. Uh, sorry, a, a, a stop if something goes wrong. Rotate is the speed at which we start pulling back on the control column. Yep. 
And V2 is the, the safety speed. So V2 is the speed that if we do have an engine failure, we can actually continue to, to climb and fly, okay. fly away safely. So between those two speeds, um, it's a little bit risky because if you lose an engine, you can lose control of a plane pretty quickly. So yep. you have to treat uh, a little bit differently. You have to sort of like take in the runway length into account. That's all taken into account, I'm assuming, as yeah, well. Yeah, that's how they calculate yeah. their V-speed. Yeah. So we've just run out a few in our centre tanks, which is expected. We'll just pull these two switches out and backwards, and that will turn off those Something tanks. Like that. Yep. And it takes the light off the dash. There was a light on the dash, which indicates... So if you turn that one back on, for example, you see a light pops up on your... Your dash as a master portion. Right yep. So if you turn them back off, the light will go away. So, and that's because we have six fuel tanks in this aircraft. Oh, oh, sorry, fuel it. pumps. We have three tanks, but the centre one is empty. We've still got plenty in each wing. Yep. Very good. All right, so that's the aircraft is all configured there. So, what we're going to do now is I'll talk through a takeoff very quickly and a circuit. So, what you see on your map now, I'll come back to the map. What you're going to see is you're going to see a couple of different things. You're going to see the range rings, which show us how far away from the airport we are. The first one's at 7 and 10 nautical miles. Mm -hmm. You see a white dash line, sort of. Might need to zoom in a little bit more. I'm assuming that's sort of the path that we're... Yeah, so that's the extended centre line of the runway. Okay. So the reason that's like that is uh, so pilots can line up with the runway before they get to it. Uh, and then you've got a 360 degree compass showing you the direction, and this is the way we're facing at the moment, that little diamond points, 160 degrees magnetic. Happy with that? Yep. Cool. So we're going to talk through a takeoff. Essentially, it's going to be pretty straightforward. You're going to add about 40% of thrust. You're going to hit this little black button, which is like cruise control. And what that does is it's automatically going to push our power up oh, okay. to the takeoff position for us, okay? So what we're going to do... Um, as we start to accelerate, I'm going to call out a couple of speeds. You hear me call out 80 knots, V1, and rotate. Oh, yeah. It's pictured there. Uh, yeah, it, it's on there to help you picture. Yeah. Um, at V1, I'd like you to start pulling up because V1 and rotate are right next to each other today. So 115 knots is V1, and rotate's 116 knots. So um, start pulling up at V1. Yep. You're going to pull back nice and firmly. You're just going to hold it, and then once the plane gets up enough speed, it will actually start to... Nose it up should the start to Correct. Um, you initially, you put the nose onto the 10, and then you go to the 15 um, and hold it. The reason we do that is because we don't want to tail strike the aircraft. And the last thing we're going to do is we are just going to set our runway heading, and you're going to follow that magenta bug. The hop. You're just going to keep your wings nice and straight as we climb up to 3,000 yep. feet. So when you're ready to go, we'll take the parking brake off. Oh. Just push it forward. And actually, while you're there, I'll get you to dim that f that front left light. Uh, by your left leg there, you'll see two white dials uh, on the left. Uh, not those ones, sorry. Th they're inoperable. For the purpose of the simulation, it's just uh, on your left-hand side there. Oh, down here. Yeah, just the one at the very front there, the little one. That's it, and it turns that front one down just so we can see a little bit better outside the cockpit. Oh, yeah. So what we'll do is we'll put our landing lights on so we can see outside. So what have we got? We've those got four metallics. Fantastic. And what we we'll do is bring up the power to 40% when you're ready. Yep, that's there. Just let it let it catch up. And we check outside. Okay, thrust is stable. Hit, Hit that. Yep, thrust starts moving up. Now you just want to be very gentle on the rudder pedals to keep the aircraft in line with the runway as we accelerate. Right now it's pretty well aligned. But essentially what you're aiming for is to have that centre line passing through your right leg and around this part of the dash. Yeah, it's sort of passing from my right leg. Yeah, so push your right pedal down a bit because we're starting to come a little bit. You only need to push it just a little bit. That's it. 80 knots. Bit of right pedal. That's it. Bit more. That's it. So you can see we're accelerating very slow because Melbourne's got a pretty long runway. V1, rotate. Just start pulling back nice and firmly. Bit more back pressure. That's it. B2, up to the 10, and now come up to the 15 degrees on the horizon. Just going to get that one off. Gear up. Okay. Just want to bring the nose up to the 15 until we pass about 1,000 feet. So just lower your nose. You see if you keep pulling back, we can go further than 15 degrees. So start reducing your pressure a little bit. We only want to be in that one there, so we're a little bit nose high. So just start pushing forward or releasing your pressure. Start okay. releasing the pressure. 
We're past the thousand feet. We want to lower the nose back down to the ten because the nose is pretty high. All right. Now what we want to do is bring our flaps up because we're fast enough. That's it. And you just want to keep the nose on the ten there until we get to just under three thousand feet. So keep pulling back a little bit. Give you a little bit of trim. Take our checklist. Landing lights uh, are off. Auto brake is off, gear is up and off. So good, we're maintaining runway heading. And what we're going to do is when we get to about 2,800 feet, which is a little bit up here, you want to start anticipating levelling off. It's very much about being ahead of the aircraft. And you want to start lowering the nose. That's it, just release the pressure. You don't need to force it down. That's it, and you want to rest it just on that first little line there, roughly. If you keep it around there, we maintain straight and level. So bring it up a little bit higher you'll find that you constantly have to make little adjustments in flight to maintain the same height. Right now we're descending and we're trending downwards, so you need to pull back a bit more. And we call that back pressure. Okay. Right now I want you to start a left-hand turn. Do one touch and go at Melbourne. So first thing you want to do is start your bank. And then what you see outside, see how the nose starts to drop? You, you then want to add in back pressure. Okay, yep. So you want to bank and then add in your back pressure. There's Melbourne out there to the left, Westgate Bridge, MCG, the Gabba. So turn a little bit steeper. I'm not turning quite steep enough. When we turn, what we're going to do is we want to turn at that 30 degree marker there. And you just want to lower your back pressure a bit. So if you're not turning steep enough, you keep climbing. So you look back at your instrument. You see how we're still climbing? Right. You just want to lower your nose a little bit. That's it. The amount of pressure you need is very much dependent on how steeply you're turning. The more shallow your turn is, the less you need to turn. But we want to keep turning, because we want to try to line up with this line here. So you want to use a bit of an instrument scan between these two to see what's going on. See, so you're getting a bit low, so you maybe, oh, maybe I need to add some more back pressure, because otherwise you'll go past 3,000. So pull back. A bit more. That's it. Much better. Start straightening up? Not quite yet. We only want to start straightening up about 15 degrees before, or 10 degrees before we get to our heading. So we're turning to a heading of 4.3. So at about 5.3 now, you can start straightening up. And to push forward a little bit at the same time to undo that extra bit of lift you put in. And if you're not quite there, just turn a little bit quicker. That's it. It doesn't have to be perfect. That's it. And add a little bit more back pressure just to watch for that descent. So you, on, the left here, on the right here you have a vertical speed indicator. Right now it's pointing downwards, which means we're going down. What you want to do is you want to have that roughly in the middle. And that will mean we're not descending or, or gaining right, height. So this one here, the artificial horizon, is only good to show your relative angle. It doesn't show you how quickly you're going up or down. That's what the vertical speed indicator does. It shows you how quickly you're going up. So go up a bit. Yep. And you see that you're only 200 feet, which is not a big change. So you don't need to pull up too much. When you're ready, you start a left-hand turn. Remember, we want to do our bank first, so our bank position. So bank, get right into it, about, there's 20 degrees. You want to keep turning, keep turning. 30, and then back pressure. That's when you want to add in, when you see that nose start to drop a little bit. That's it. And you see, if you look back at your vertical speed indicator, you're not really climbing or descending. You're maintaining the same height, which means we've got the right amount of back pressure applied. Sit straighten up. See, we don't want to cut in the turn too much, so we're starting to cut in, so come back to the right. That's it, and a little bit of pitch up and straighten up. Only need to make little constant little corrections. So we're starting to descend. Bring your wings nice and level. So we're still slightly turning. So turn to the left a bit. That's it, and pitch up because we are slowly starting to descend. So we can talk about the touch and go. Do you remember what, what a touch and go was, Mark? Yeah, it's basically you coming in, like for a landing, you land, but then you throttle back and then you throttle forward, take off again. Yep, that's right. So we're going to do that, and then we're going <coughs> to fly on to Adelaide. So right now, what I want you to do is slice down to about two hundred and ten knots. And we want to start descending to 2,000 feet. So the way we go about descending 
you saw it doesn't take much to descend. You just want to rest the nose just above the horizon and you'll see how quickly we start to lose height. So just pitch back a little bit more to anticipate that nose coming down. Lovely. So that's what about 1,200 feet a minute or thereabouts? Yeah, we want to send about 1,000 feet a minute, so around that mark there. Now what I'm going to have to do is, because we're flying to Melbourne first... Fantastic. So now you want to start adding a little bit more back pressure because we're going to be flying a little bit slower. And I want you to start a left hand turn when you're ready. A little bit more back pressure. And you know when you're going to go is flaps one. You want to bring the flaps to the first setting. See a little bit of an inversion layer down here. Very sign of a very calm day down there oh, yeah. and stable atmosphere I'm going to slow us down to 180 knots and when you're ready we'll bring the flaps out to 5 but you want to keep turning the trick is to keep turning okay, yeah. so flaps 5 that's it and since we're going to be slowing down that's when you're going to want a little bit more back pressure as well because that's when we'll start to descend a bit more the slower you fly, the more back pressure you need to maintain so the same height. So we're trying height. to maintain 2,000 at the moment. That's right. We're just trying to keep 2,000 until we see the runway and we want to descend. So straighten up there, anticipating it. All right, looking at your left-hand window, did you see the airport yet? We've still got one more turn to go, so we probably won't see it just yet. Yeah. Just push forward a little bit. Not quite. That's it. Keep flying straight. Just a small correction there. It's all right. It doesn't need to... Bit too big there, and just add a little bit of pitch up because we're going to descend pretty quickly. And we're only at that 1600 feet above the ground, really, because there's our radio altimeter, which is more accurate. Okay, shows yeah. us we're 2000 pressure height above the ground, which is uh, measured off the pressure of the air going through the port. But our radio, which our radio altimeter, which is like a sonar, shows us we're only 1500 feet. So okay. we always believe that one more. We're just going to maintain our height when you're ready. I want you to bring the gear down. And so there's going to be a lot more drag now, so you, you probably feel the need to pitch up a little bit more. Alright, gear down three greens. We're going to go to flaps to 15 when you're ready. And that's going to be our setting for the touch and go. Now since we're land, uh, doing a touch and go, we don't want to use any of our spoilers or our reverses because the aim's to keep on going. So we're not going to sit those? That's correct. So we're just going to keep heading straight for a second, just lower your nose. So we've got more lift and more drag now, so the nose is going to want to balloon. So you just got to push forward to compensate for that. So and pitch up a little bit more to make that change. When you're ready, I want you to make a nice, gentle left-hand turn and pitch back a little bit more. Well, you'll need a fair amount of back pressure here. So a bit more back pressure. A bit more back pressure. And that's it. You just want to hold that turn, but we want to try and maintain 2,000 feet. That's it. And keep that turn going. See the runway yet? It's right there. Oh, yeah. Yep. I'm going to bring the power down because we're quite high up. I'm just going to mainly take it. I just want you to lower your nose and keep turning. So keep turning nice and steeply. Otherwise, we're going to overshoot it. That's it. And just start to pitch back nicely for me. That's it. A bit more. More back pressure. That's it. Pull it back. That's it. Pull it back a little bit more. And lower the nose. You want to aim just before the start of the runway. And you want to keep coming to the left because we're quite close to the left. Pitch up a little bit more. Think That's rate. it. We've got plenty Think of runway, rate. which is a good thing. Think just straighten rate. up. What you're going to do is we're going to just keep flying straight. And then once we're over the runway, we're going to make a correcting turn. So start lower the nose a bit more. 500. We're going to land long. We're not going to land at the start. We're just going to use a bit half of it. Start to pitch up and turn to the right a little bit. 
Pitch up a bit more. That's it, a bit more. That's it, a bit more. Too low, bit more. Bit of right pedal. Too low, laps. That's it. One, two, low, laps. Straighten up, and then low, what you want to do is just want to gently bring too the power low, back. Laps. Yep, 30, all the way to idle. Twenty. Ten. That's it, and then what you want to do is you want to bring the power all the way up. Yep, stop there, and hands back on the controls. And rotate. Since we're already at speed, you can already pull up. So about 10 degrees. Yep, that's it. And now up to 15. And now you want to go gear up. Reach over and bring the wheels up. Lower your nose. Don't keep pulling back because otherwise we'll stall. You only want to keep it around 15 degrees angle of attack. So that's it. And then once we pass 1,000 feet there, you're going to lower the nose back down to the 10. That's it. Start pushing forward. Remember anticipating the aircraft's going to do. That's it. We'll go flaps to 1. That's it, and keep the nose on the 10, we want to keep climbing. See how we're not climbing? That's it, we just want to slowly start that climb by putting the nose on the 10, and you can bring our flaps up too. Rightio, the next thing we're going to do is we're, we're going to show that we're going to keep climbing away. I'm going to let you climb the aircraft for a bit, otherwise we're just sort of an autopilot, and we're going to follow the standard arrival route, uh, departure route, sorry. Okay. So we're going to climb to flight level 360. Keep the nose up there, that's perfect. She set our speed to 230 no, uh, 30 knots, or 40 knots, 240 knots will do. And what I want you to do is we'll start a right hand turn whilst we're climbing because we're going to climb to flight level 360. Looking outside as well, make sure it's going all good out there. This plane will climb like a rocket. Just lower your nose to keep it at the roughly the 10. That's it. Usually by now would be on autopilot. Okay. Um, but otherwise you don't get a fly. And the aim of, aim of uh, what we're going to do, Mark, is what we're going to do is we're going to follow this line here. And that's going to take the us... The solid line. The solid line. That's going to take us towards <laughs> Adelaide. So start pitching back. Keep climbing. We're going to intercept the track at Limley and then we'll engage the autopilot. So keep climbing, you want to keep pulling back. Put the nose on the 10. That's it. Through a layer of cloud. So what I want you to do is uh, face toward, once you're facing towards Limley and on line with that pink line, I want you to straighten up. Start straightening up now. And now what I want you to do is I want you to reach over and press this command button. This command button here. Yep. Now if you let go, the aircraft's going to manage itself on the autopilot. Okay. Yep. And I want you to set uh, LNAV, which stands for lateral navigation. And what that's going to do It'll is that's going to... Keep it climbing. It's going to keep... It, no, so uh, within so the flight. Yeah, so this function here, the LNAV, what that does is that keeps you on your flight path. That stands for longitudinal navigation. The VNAV stands for vertical navigation. So if we had that mode engaged, but, but they would work together. And it would help climb the aircraft up to a certain point. That's programmed in this flight management computer. So at Waypoint Limley, or Little Me, we have a height requirement to be at or above 7,000 feet. Right now we're at 8,500, so no worries. But if we had LNAV on, it would try to obtain that height by that waypoint. Okay. So at Nevis, we should be at flight level 340. If we had LNAV on, it would program it. So by the time we got there, we're at 340. Mm. It would put in the appropriate amount of power. and. Yep, yep exactly right. So the next thing we want to do is we have a checklist to do when we're past 10,000 feet. What we want to do is we want to turn our landing lights off. We're not quite there yet. And then we want to standardise our altimeters. 
So what I'll get you to do is we're passing 10,000 feet is we'll turn all our landing lights off. That's it, and you want to push in this button there. Push it in. Yep. Oh, that resets really it. It sets it to a standard pressure. Yep. Because everyone wants to be on the same pressure above a certain height. And then we want to set our starter switches to off. So that's this one? Yep. So the reason we have them on continuous uh, during departure is constantly igniting the, the igniter. Um, it, can, it is usually self-sufficient, but if we have a lot of rain or an engine flames out, we want to have it keep you igniting. You want to be able to... You want it to be still trying to ignite itself, yep. so it tries and looks after itself. So that you don't have to worry about that, in theory. Yeah, so um, it gives you... Okay. Above 10,000, you've got plenty of time to deal with an engine failure. When you're yeah. under 10,000 feet, you don't have a lot of time. The other thing about being under 10,000 feet is you can't go faster than 240 knots, but since we're above it now, what I'll get you to do is dial this up to about 320. So the power will increase. And what I want you to do is I want you to press LNAV mode, and the aircraft's automatically going to look after itself. VNAV or... Oh, sorry, VNAV. VNAV. So you see, it disappears, takes the vertical speed away, because now what it's going to do, it's going to set the speed we want to fly and the altitude we want to fly. So we're going to climb at 2,900 feet per minute. So we'll be at 3,600 feet not too, in not too long. So that's 315 now. Because I know there's ground speed and air speed. Sure. So, so what I'll explain to you, so 315 is the air speed we have set. Once we're uh, into a really high speed, we start to get what's called to the Mach numbers. So fighter jets, you're probably here breaking the sound at you know, Mach 1.0. Fighter jets usually go about Mach 2. We're going 0.56 Mach, which is about 57% uh, of the speed of sound at the moment. So that's the percentage of the speed of sound. I saw some stuff last year. Uh, like British Airways, I think it was, broke some of the records going across. Yes, yeah, yep. And it's all because of... Uh, a 747. They've got a nice tailwind. <laughs> yeah, so the difference between ground speed and airspeed is you have two speeds. You have a speed which are in the air. So the way an aircraft's airspeed is measured is there are two probes on the front of a plane called a pitot tube, which is these two here. That's why they've got the heat for them. And what they do yeah. is they measure the dynamic pressure of the air going into the tube. They then take a static variable away, and that shows them how far they calibrate it to show a speed. However, you, if you have a headwind, you're going to have air coming in faster so at the tube. Faster. So it's going to register that you're going faster than you actually are. If you have a tailwind, it's going to register you are going slower than you actually are. Yeah. So you have a thing called ground speed, which is your your air, uh, sorry your true airspeed component plus whatever tailwind or headwind you have. So if you have a headwind, you you minus the speed because you're going slower. So let's say we're going 120 knots and we have a 20 knot headwind. Well, re realistically, we're only going 100 knots yeah. across the ground. So, if you have a tailwind, it should be plus another 20 knots on, so it would be going 140 knots. So, uh, I saw someone, uh, aviation YouTuber, posted yesterday, it was a picture of a Virgin plane, and it just looked like it was stationary yep. over the sea. It's like, as they're coming in, some of it, I think, it was relative yep. from their point of view as well, but it just looked like it was not even moving. Strong headwind. Yeah. There's actually uh, a funny story about that, is if you... You can get some aircraft that maximum speeds are only like 60 to 80 knots, like the little aircraft out there. Yeah. Uh, and when you get a really big front in, there's actually a video of... Um, I've seen a, like a little micro light yeah, where they're taking just, the phone, they just look like they're stationary. They're stationary, and that's yeah. true. And so I've seen videos of planes going backwards. <laughs> so, quite so. And not a lot of people can uh, comprehend that. So as the aircraft climbs, what we're looking out for is we're just monitoring the instruments, making sure nothing's going wrong. And it's pretty much a sit back and relax. And then usually what we'd be doing is we're looking at our fuels and we're planning our arrival into Adelaide. Yeah. So I'll take you through the flight management computer. So here we've got each way, uh, distance to each waypoint. And it also gives us the time to each waypoint. So if we go to progress, it shows us the time in GMT, or Zulu time as we call it, that we're going to arrive in Adelaide. It's really annoying because I don't actually have a... Usually we'd use these clock here, but they're not actually the real ones. Are no, they dummies. So it's really annoying. You can't actually tell what the actual time is in the sim time. Um, you can only see what the time is here. But we can make a prediction. Oh, is that what the Z stands for? Yeah, Z is the Zulu. So this is the time. ATA is um, actual time of arrival. Um, that's the time the computer says we're going to be there. It's really an ETA. 
But since these computers are so accurate, they have an A for an actual time of arrival. That's what that abbreviation there is. So what we have here is distance to go to Neville, 43.7 uh, nautical miles. That's reflected at the top here. And we're going to get there at 0934. Uh, 0934. So that's the time it's, it's estimating us to get to our next waypoint. So what type of stuff do you do? Transport wise, I've uh, done a whole heap of different stuff. Uh, containers, uh, cool. uh, mostly refrigerated stuff. Uh -huh. uh, grocery, mostly local. A little bit of interstate. Nice. B doubles, singles. One road train. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it must be nice. Hard. Only moving it around a yard, but still. <laughs> so it still counts. <laughs> still counts. Must be hard to back one of those things up. Uh, generally speaking, uh, where I did it, they really don't want you to back them up. You're not really supposed to, mm. unless uh, unless you really have to. But uh, one of the old timers, he told me some of the stories he's had, but he said, uh, what are you reversing that for? So yeah, like, I mean, obviously when you reverse a trailer, it goes in the opposite direction. If yeah. you have two, it just goes into the direction you, you got to do expecting. the opposite of the opposite, and then it's, uh, yeah. it took a bit of, uh, you know... And you don't want to get it too... Twisted up, either. Twisted yeah. up. Have you seen that uh, photo of the chip stuck in the, the canal? Oh, that evergreen. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen all the memes. Yeah. Uh, unreal how that something like that happens. And it's like this tiny little uh, front end bulldozer thing Just trying, trying to dig to it out. <laughs> <laughs> no way. The only way they're going to get that out, I think, is if they, they need to take the containers off. Yeah, that, that's that, what that, that, that'll lift the ship up. Yeah, that's what they were saying. They'll have to. Uh, Start unloading. Um, uh, you just wonder how that happens. But he's watching the uh, ship tracking, all these ships going around the bottom of uh, South Africa. It's like never, they've never seen so much traffic go that, that way. way. All those pirates down there would love it. Oh, yeah, we yeah, should be so. taken. So. What we do is go under the legs, and if you what you would do, if you want to zoom out the rest of your map, I'll show you how far we've got to yeah, run. Which one is that? So if you twist this all the way around to the right. I'll twist this. So it shows us how far away we've got to, to go towards Adelaide. So what we'll do now, since we're on flight plan route, so here we got uh, a waypoint called Dukes. I think, don't correct me, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that's Dukes as in Dukes Highway. I don't... No. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, that's in South Australia? Yeah. Where's that around? That's around... Dukes Highway, that's sort of uh, basically the... Oh, which one's that one? Because I think it goes out of SA towards New South Wales or Victoria? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, so that, that Dukes Waypoint would be situated on the highway. That's why they would call it Dukes. That's its geographic position. Drina is a little bit further than that which is a Drina, which will be the like lake. You probably won't see it because it'll be coming to dark pretty soon as we come into Adelaide. Once we get to our cruising height, what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll take you through a landing briefing. I'll show you how we're going to come into Adelaide and we'll set up the aircraft to come in. So you do a bit of simming at home? Have you ever done the flight management computer and stuff? No, then, I've or? tried it. It's trying to understand it without uh, having someone going through it. Because you can watch all the videos in the world, but it's easier to learn if you've got yeah. someone... Pointing it out. Yeah. It's like when I told my cousin I was doing this, she goes, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And I <laughs> said, yeah, yeah, it's a Parafoot Airport. And she goes, oh, I might uh, get that for her eldest daughter for her birthday in October. Yeah. So. I said, oh... It's really good for, like, you know, people who have never done it before as well, because yeah. we can tailor it to, to anyone, really, yeah. so... Because she... Uh, I don't know exactly what she did within, but I think she did work for Qantas Link uh -huh. at, in Port Lincoln. Yep, at, nice. At the airport there. But she's living in Sejuna now, so... Yeah, right. Yeah. I said to her, living in Sejuna, she get a private pilot's license. Yeah, it's absolutely. Make it easier to fly back into Adelaide, because they're always coming over to Adelaide. It takes so a while to get there. From Port Lincoln. So how long's the drive over to Port Lincoln? Uh, probably about five hours. Yeah. I've never actually been to Port Lincoln, but I know there's a ferry that goes across again now. Oh, really? I think. Uh, oh, I think I... it leaves somewhere 
near Wallaroo or somewhere, somewhere yeah, over right. that way. But yeah, I've only ever flown into the airport. I've never been into the town. Oh, okay. So do they fly? Can a seven three seven land there, or is that a bit um, big? Or I thought they could probably land one there, but there's just no need to. Yeah. Um, runway's pretty decent size runway there. Um, in a pinch, they could land one there. Yeah, sort of if thing. they needed to. The problem is, um, it's yeah. usually the, qu the, the the weight of the aircraft yeah. that causes the problem. Um, people just don't understand. Like runways are made out of like solid six feet, co you know, six feet concrete, and a lot of them, a lot of the big international ones like Adelaide, and but then you know, you those smaller ones are just asphalt, just asphalt or, or yeah. worse, gravel, grass. But the heavier the aircraft, they sink into the ground. Yeah. So right now we're doing about 80% of the speed of sound, as you can see there. Point eight, yep. Our ground speed is 460 knots, and our choice speed's 462, so they're pretty <coughs> smack on. So it's not that, uh, not that much wind out there. No, we've only got, so this is our wind variable, shows us where our wind's coming from. We've only got a 5 knot crosswind there, on this leg. And we have just under 1,000 feet to go till we reach our cruising altitude. What I want you to do, you see where it says root discontinuity here? What uh, I want you, want you to do is press Mopri, and then I want you to press that into then. Press which one? So press Mopri, and then go to Put the, it there. Yep. And then execute it. And what that does is that's lining up all those waypoints we selected earlier. So our next waypoint is going to be Bordeaux, then we're going to go to Dukes, uh, Lake Alexandrina. I don't know these ones, I don't know roughly in the world where they are. And then we're going to go to Gully, which is Tea Tree Gully. Yep. Uh, and then Comes Botbury. down along North East Road. Yep. So Gully is Tea Tree Gully. That's where it lines us up. And then we go over Modbury, which is Motbury, and it's I. So I, th these letters uh, actually have meanings on an approach. So an I it usually means uh, initial approach fix or something okay. like such. So, so Motbury is Modbury, but the last letter is just the indicator for us. Gucktear, I'm still trying to figure out where that one is in Adelaide. Uh, I know where it is. Oh, on which the one? Gucktear. I'm trying to figure out what suburb or what significant feature they've named that waypoint off. So you know how at Globe Derby Park there they have the horse trotting? There's a waypoint called Trots. Oh, okay. On, over the park. Um, so they name them after significant features. Uh, so we're at flight yeah. level 360. We're on the way to Adelaide. I'm going to take you through this piece of paper here. This is called an instrument landing chart, so if you want to hold it, that's fine. Yep. I'll explain it to you. Bring it into the middle here, and I'll start pointing things out for you. So see Gully? That corresponds to Gully on here. Yep. And we need to be at 3,800 feet at that waypoint. So so then you have Motpru here, Gukti, which is our, our final approach fix, and then at the runways here. So this is the ILS glide path right here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're doing the ILS Zulu runway 23 Adelaide. And this is, uh, what it shows on here, it shows a, a little bit of information. It can be quite overwhelming. You see a couple of frequencies here. So the first one here is the ILS frequency. So that's the frequency where you tune to actually activate the nav aid. Okay. So what I want you to hear is tune 109.70. The, sm the small uh, dial turns the point decimal number. So I want 109.70. That's it. And that's in the standby frequency. When we want to activate it, not right yet, we, we transfer it over. Just press that button. Correct. And that'll switch it to the active frequency. Yep. And then that one will come over and standby. Yep. The next one we want to do is we want to do our VOR frequency, which is going to be 116.4. Okay. And that's going to So that's 116.4. And we can probably activate that now. That's not going to be a problem. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a, a look at the back of the approach. What you have here, it's, which is called uh, a sector diagram. This here that shows a 25 nautical mile ring of the airport. Mm -hmm. And it shows the, the safe heights we can be at. So at night time, we can't see the ground. And we're not always in air traffic control coverage. So what we do is they survey all the area around an airport up to 25 miles. 3,800 feet out to the east is the minimum height we can fly because of the Adelaide Hills. So that would be this height here. Yep, so it's included in there. So if we wanted to fly west of the airport, the minimum safe height is 1,900 feet. Okay. And out to the southeast, it's about 9, 7, 
100 feet. So that's like Southern Expressway, that area there. Oh, okay, yep. So, because Adelaide sits in a basin, you can sort of see see it here on the map as well. It shows it here where the hills are. So what we'll do is when we come in, we'll intercept the ILS at And what that's going to do is that's going to guide us down towards the runway. Since uh, we, we have a minimum uh, safe height, since we're on an ILS, our minimum height is going to be 270 feet. So if we can't see the runway by that height, that's when the pilot chooses to go around and yeah. fly to a different airport. This little t t diagram here is a little bit in more interesting. This is called a circling diagram. So, for example, if we're coming into land for this runway, but at the last minute they get a runway change, we can actually circle around and land on another runway. Oh, okay. um, and there's no circling out here. It could be for a lot of reasons, like obstacles or houses that they don't want soundproofing on. So that's what the typical instrument approach chart will tell us. Where it says 222, two, two, that's the course of the runway. So that's the that's this heading of the runway. Okay, yep. So that's our final heck, um, bug we line up, and that helps line up the runway. So lots to take in, obviously. And but obviously, that's uh, the distance out. Yeah, from, yeah. So you want to try and stay within that height profile. Yeah, so it's actually broken down just a little bit up here. So when we're at 12 nautical miles, we should be at 3,800 feet, which is around here. And we should start descending at around 10 nautical miles. At 9 nautical miles, we should be at this height, you know, and it counts down. At 5 nautical miles, we check to see what our height is, and it should be, should be about 1,600 feet off the ground, roughly. So that gives you the guidance. So since we're doing the ILS, which is guided by a computer, we just double-check it. But if we were hand-flying it, we need to check it, Realise we're too high, etc. So I'm assuming with the ILS, uh, something on the ground talks to the plane, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so and when it sort of like intercepts it, it just starts to control the height profile. Yeah. So an ILS uh, stands for an instrument landing system. So what they have on the ground, they have two radio VHF radio receivers. They have one horizontally and then they have one that does it vertically. Okay, yeah. And they're paired together. So the horizontal one is called a localizer, and what that does is you'll see some diamonds pop up on your map display uh, later on. Um, and they, the localizer guides the aircraft so it's in the middle of the runway. So it uses a radio to verify its position and then move it across accordingly. Yep. And then the vertical one, vertical radio is called a glide slope. Okay. So once the aircraft gets to the height of the glide slope, uh, what the computer does is it will tell the aircraft to start descending to maintain about a three degree approach path. What it does is the radio wave goes, well, the aircraft should be here, but it's actually here. And then the air tells the aircraft, you should actually be at, you know, this height, but you're here. And then the aircraft's autopilot or pilot, whoever's flying we'll the plane, will, go, the, will adjust the height. Yep. I'm assuming most of that would probably be done through throttle more uh, than anything else. Um, so typically if it's not done on autopilot, yeah, they, the power just slows down a little bit yep. and, the, and the nose drops accordingly. Depends what pilot you are. Some prefer to do it through power, some do it through attitude, so. Cool, we'll dim the back of the lights now. Uh, so you, on that uh, left leg there, you would have seen the other little white dial. We'll turn it right down. Get a nice sunset. But yeah, typically what they'll do is they'll either clip these to the front here so they'll look at them, or on the side. Here, now they have iPads, so... Oh, yeah. <coughs> so, looking at our map, we can see our estimated time to Adelaide. So, we pass there at 9.34. We should be arriving uh, at Dukes at 9.55. So, that's about 20 minutes. Uh, in real life time, but we've sped it up, yep. so it's about 10 minutes. Um, and overall, distance-wise, we're 30, 60, 120, 140, 146, 157, about 160, 166. We're about 170 nautical miles away from Adelaide. So, so, yeah, it should take us about 20 minutes or so to get okay. to Adelaide. So, what are all the different functions on this, like, 
like you got uh, these data, air, I'm assuming airport, yep. all that sort of stuff. So we've got a couple of different functions there. So they control all your map, what you can see on your map. So terrain, T-E-R-R, -T -E you can't really see it, it's a bit scrubbed out. But if you press that when we're at a lower altitude, you won't see it now because we're pretty high up. Oh, it'd show up like... It shows up all the terrain in fancy colours. Usually different colours. Yeah, so when you're clear of it, it will show it in green. It will outline it. If you're going to possibly conflict it, it shows it in yellow. And if you're too, if you're lower than the actual terrain, it will show it in red. Oh, okay. Um, pause shows your position. Um, it just shows your exact position. doesn't do much. Uh, ARPT is an abbreviation for airport. Show us all the rel the airports around us within a certain radius. So if we press it, okay, shows us all the airports in the database that are around. A lot of little airports. NHL is nil, so we've just passed the border. That's what that tells me. So Borto would be border town. Oh, okay, yeah. makes sense. So if we go to data, it just shows us um, our, t our next estimated arrival time and what time, what altitude we're flying. Waypoint shows us all the IFR waypoints around us and fixes. Um, you usually have to zoom in to see them all because there's so many. Yep. STA will show you your arrival times and stuff. Oh, sorry, uh, stations. So that will show you all your VOR radios and stuff. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, oh, yeah, that would be these. Yep, so MTG's Mount Gambier. Tell you that for a fact. And there's the waypoint ones that have just popped up. Oh, can't get rid of them. I've broken it, damn it. And <laughs> WX stands for weather. Oh, okay. So if we had the re weather radar on, which is this little panel here, okay. we can program it as so, it would show us the, any inclement weather. But yeah, typically during flight pilots, they're uh, just monitoring, cross-checking the instruments, thinking about diversions, all of that, so I can get rid of it. Can't get rid of it. Oh, there we go. Sometimes the buttons are a little fidgety. That's oh, just gonna have to sit there. So when we get a little bit closer to Drina, we'll start our top of descent, and we'll start descending into in towards Adelaide. Um, what we do, um, descent usually is talked about a little bit beforehand. That like what they do is they talk about condition, weather conditions in Adelaide. Well, they do. If they can't get side of the runway where they're going to go to, so they've got a preformed plan. They will talk about the traffic in Adelaide, all that type of thing yep. between each other. Nice sunset, though. Got my chair on for today. Uh, I've got to go home and. Uh got painters coming next week so just move a whole heap of furniture nice. and all that sort of stuff and that's going to be fun fantastic lots of furniture so while the aircraft keeps flying I'm going to start loading up some weather and you see
Sequence. Yeah, that's all right. It's not a bit smoother. I would have hated to have been a pilot um, back in the 70s and 60s where there was no autopilot and they were doing long transatlantic flights. Doing it all. All no autopilot hand flying. So I zoom back in on your map, and uh, we'll start talking about descent, because when we get to Drina, that's when we're going to start descending. So I zoom in the other way. No. See how, like, a little bit more? You see how there's a little TD there? That stands for top of descent. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what we want to do is we want to set our altitude uh, to about 3,800 feet. So when you're ready to do that, the aircraft won't descend. It will start descending when automatically once we get to Drino. The power will come back and the aircraft will start descending. Are we oh, are doing it all. Just a second. Why has it done that? Just do that for a second. That's weird. Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Must be me. Commonly it needs to be at 13,000 feet. Right, okay, we'll start descending. So set 13,000 feet. It's going to do it manually. It's going to bring back our speed. Yep, set to 13,000, then press vertical speed mode. Yeah, that's, uh, that one there. Oh, yeah. Yep. And what I want you to do is we're going to increase it a little bit. And um, since we are going to use the speed brake too, because we're coming in pretty fast, so what I want you to do is lift this lever up, and you can bring it all the way back, because we're we're in the we're in the sky, and then just start increasing this some more. And what we're looking for on the map is a little ring to pop up before this waypoint called Comley. Oh, okay. I've got a little bit late on the descent there, so we're descending around four thousand feet a minute. Typically, this is a pretty steep descent. Aircraft don't usually need to descend this fast, but they have the ability. So, uh, what we have uh, is we have a nice layer of stratus cloud. So, once you enter the cloud, we won't be able to see much uh, until we get to Adelaide. It's amazing how you feel like you're moving. Yeah. Oh, it's all relative. Yeah. So, 31. So another 23,000 feet to go, roughly. Uh, sorry. 20... Yeah, 23. Uh, 27,000 feet to go, to 13,000. So we're, we're pretty high. So we're going to be a little bit delayed, but what we can do is we can set the aircraft to hold. So if we go to this hold page here, and we go to Comly, if we press Comly, and then hold it calmly. Okay, yep. And we set our leg times. It's right turn and target speed. And we press Excellent. OK. What it's going to do is when we get to hold to that waypoint, a little circle comes up and it's okay. going to start holding. Holding. And then we can reduce the aircraft down a little bit. To reduce its rate of descent. And pilots will do that for a number of reasons. Sometimes they get told to hold on route because there's traffic up ahead. Um, they need to fix the problem. For whatever delay there could be anywhere, somewhere. Yeah, well, sometimes they have a problem with the aircraft and they want some time to work with it. So they'll, yeah. they'll call up the air traffic controller saying, you know, we need requesting a hold at this waypoint from this time to this time at this height. Yeah. And then essentially they book that slot out so no other aircraft will fly through it.
So once we get to Conley, the aircraft will make a right hand turn and it will start descending some more. And when we're ready to exit the hold, we just press the next waypoint and it will take us out of the hold and take us direct there. Yep. So that happens wherever you are in that circuit? Yeah, well, it depends. So once we're, if we're holding well, on route... It depends on where you are within the circuit at Yeah, the so if we're holding on route, we'll typically... We can exit the hold whenever we want, but if we're doing an approach, we have to do the full thing. Okay. So since we're still on route, technically, um, we can exit the hold at any point. And there's a... Uh, you can start to see Lake Alexandrina and oh stuff yeah, punch yep. through the cloud there. Yeah, so typically as well, the aircraft would have started descending a lot earlier um, and it's just on a very shallow descent path and you don't typically notice it in the back because you're descending so slowly. Yeah. Now I've heard uh, them say something about you, you, uh, like you have your flight levels and then is that above a certain altitude or? Yeah, so we have flight levels and altitude. So in Australia, it depends on the country. Um, in Australia, anything above 10,000 feet is considered a flight level. Okay. Yep. Anything below 10,000 is considered an, an altitude. Um, and you pronounce it, so if you're flying at 6,000 feet, you say you're flying at 060, altitude 060. If you're flying at 16,000 feet, you say you're flight level 160. Okay. Aircraft's going to level off sh shortly. Do you want to double check this weather? Oh no, I'll leave it for now. And what we'll do is once we're about halfway during the hold, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to press Disher. You're going to press Disher, and then you're going to press Comly. So it overwrites it, and then execute, and then we'll go back onto our flight plan route. Okay. So you want me to do that now, or...? Once we're about halfway during the through the hold there. Okay. And speed brake, probably bring that back. Ah, uh, we can slow, yeah, yeah, bring it back up to the top. Just so we don't overspeed the aircraft. Yep. Alright, when you're ready, uh, you can press so that one there. Yep. And, and then, then calmly. Up and then execute it. So now the aircraft will automatically start turning to the right and tracking for Comley. So we start to circle in towards Adelaide. Should that vertical navigation be on or...? Oh, we can manually control it. You can press it now if you like. Press it now. Let's bring the speed back up. We want to... And what you want to do is set uh, 3,800 feet there on the... Uh, 3,800. That'll be the top of the uh, intercept. That's it. Just playing around a little bit to, to delayed on the screens here. Sometimes it doesn't like this inclement weather. What does this uh, simulator run? What? Um, for the flight box, I think it's uh, Flight Simulator X, so it's fairly old, older model of flight simulator. Um, it's got three projectors and about eight computers running the whole setup. 
and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven screens. Flash two five zero. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting the target speed that we want to fly at. Okay. What it's going to do? It's going to bring back the power, and we've got a speed restriction at ten thousand feet. Um, the vertical nav's playing up at the moment, so we're just going to go back to, to manually doing it. So, turn that off or so yeah, go to level change, and then speed, and set that to two hundred and forty. Aircraft's going to start slowing down, and we're going to just start manually to start descending. Zoom out a little bit so you can see the the rest of the profile if you like. So that's that one there. Other way. You see a little green arc pop up on the map. Yep. That little green arc shows you where we're going to end up. That's going to show us our future position. So we'll be at three thousand eight hundred by about there. And we're ready to activate some frequencies now. So we're going to transfer mine over. We're going to leave yours for a second uh, until we're a little bit closer. So it, when I'm ready, I just press that one. Yep. So what you see here, you see it says VOR2. So we're on the VOR2 radio. Adelaide is the identifier and we're 29 miles away. About 60 kilometres. Right. Zoom back in on your map there so you get a little bit of a clearer view. So you see up there where it says Bracky uh, on the yep. map? That's Inver Bracky. Okay. So this uh, route takes us over Woodside and that area there. So we're approaching 10,000 feet. What we want to do is we're going to put our landing lights back on. Uh, engine starters to continuous. Um, and Turn them one to the right. Let me get that one for you. On. Yep, that's on. And then you're going to set your altimeter back to the mode it was on. Serious. There you are. And we're going to try and slow down just before we reach uh, 10,000 feet. So I've deployed the speed brake. Because okay. the aircraft, unless they've got permission to typically fly uh, slower, slower than 250 knots below 10,000, just for spacing requirements. As we got cl get close, we've got a nice thick layer of clouds just below us. So you won't be able to see, you can see the coast out there. Oh, you could see the there coast. Yep. Now we're in a cloud. And I want you to slow us to 210 knots. Beautiful. Now you can set your frequency in your radio if you like. Set that one. That's it. Set our, our VRF speed, so we're going to land uh, flaps 30 at 120 knots. That's our target speed, it will pop up on the map there yeah. once we get a little bit closer. Yeah. Fantastic. And then what we want to do is we want to arm our auto brakes to setting 2 S for, S for Adelaide's runway. Fix. Shows us where the airport is. Fantastic. So we're going a little bit closer. Mm. We're still about 20 miles away. But if I put my terrain mode on, we should start to see the train and stuff popping up eventually. So we'll do that. Is it on or off? How do you know whether it's actually on or off? Uh, we'll say no, ter no ter at the bottom if there's oh no, yeah, terrain, no terrain, so it won't pop anything up. Just checking their flight management computer. 
Right, you can probably uh, oh, we'll just keep going for a little bit. Um, we're not too far away from intercepting our oh, our approach. Shelly, oh, what's that? Omdin, what's that one? Uh, Omdin, Omdin. I don't know that one off by heart. Um, um, not too sure actually. Don't know where that is relative to us in the world, but Gully is Tea Tree Gully, yep. so it can't be too far away to the east of Tea Tree Gully. Maybe Black Hill or somewhere like that, or no, it can't be Cuddly Creek or something. Now you would see a little diamond popping up on the map here. Okay, that's yep, our glide slope. Yep. So when it's like that, it means we're above it. When it comes from below, if it's at the top, it means we're below the glide slope. Slope. So ideally, you want to try and keep it in that centre. In the middle. Yep. That's it. And this is your your lateral guidance. Okay. Yep. So right now we're not aligned with the runway, so you don't see a diamond there. Oh, okay, you're down there. That's correct. Yep. What I want you to do is set up 222 in the course bar. And once we get to Gakdi, uh, we can track direct to Motpri now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go Motpri, load it up, and take us directly to Motpri. And when you're ready, we'll go flaps one. And what we'll do is we'll put the speed brakes to, uh, to the armed position. Yep, just there. Aircraft will keep descending. And at Mopri, the height we should be at is 3,200. So you can set 3,200 on the map here. 3,200. That's it. Whoop. And if you look at your map display, you'll see that diamond is showing roughly in that right spot there. Yep, it's a little bit above. So a little, little bit, bit below. below, that's it. But we're not intercepted with the ILS yet, we haven't activated it. So when we're ready to activate it, you see where it says APP? So not when, yet. When you're ready, just press that one. Yep, and that uh, will activate the approach mode hold. Right, yeah, set our speed to 180 knots. Right, when you're ready, press the approach mode. So you see single channel will pop up on the map there, and the aircraft's automatically going to start turning. LNAV comes off, heading mode comes off, and it's flying the instrument landing okay. system. So right now we're, we're intercepted the ILS, or we've intercepted the localizer, so the aircraft's going to line up. You know when the glide slope's been uh, intercepted, when the aircraft continues to descend with this diamond and leaves the height. See the diamonds. Across yep, so theoretically runway. in front of us we're in line with the runway, we just can't see it yet. Now we'll go flaps 5. And you'll see the aircraft will keep descending. Just want to turn that one on, so you turn the DME on. As you can see the diamond's going to start lining us up, a lot of movements are made. Set that to 222 as well. That one there. That one there. Right, yeah, and then what we want to do is we want to reduce our speed to 160 knots and bring the gear down. So reduce it to 160. Yep. And then bring the gear down. Yep, it's going to help slow us down. Drag. And you see the speed will rapidly start to drop off. Oh, okay, yep. And we're established on the ILS. Now we'll go flaps 15. Oh, we'll just wait till we get to about 180 knots and we'll go flaps 15. Just to play it safe. So it still can't see it. It's here outside yet. Still not visual with the runway. Now we'll go flaps 15. So once we can see the runway, what we'll do is we'll hand control back over to you and you can land the aircraft. Okay. We can see a bit of something down there. Bit of ground starting to pop out? Yeah, just down there. So it slows down to about 145 knots. And we want to go flaps to 25. So now we're 1,000 feet above the ground. I'm starting to see a little bit. Just yeah. You start as we break through the clouds. Oh, yeah, I can see some buildings. We'll go flaps 30. 
flat was 30. Once we can see the runway, I will disconnect it. So the throttle stays auto, doesn't it? Yeah, until until sure. we'll, about 100 feet above the ground, and you'll put your hand on it. Disconnect. We'll disconnect the auto throttle. Pull it back to idle, and land. So this is simulating a real bad afternoon into Adelaide. Still within its tolerances, though. We should still we should be able to see the runway in a second. Start to see the lights pop up in front of us. So, do you see the lights? Oh yeah, yep. They're the guidance there. lights. So yep. So that's not the actual runway itself. You now have control. Start to pull up just a little bit. That's it. Pull up a little bit more. A little bit more to the right. Pull up a little bit more. Come a little bit to the right. There's the runway. That's it. Come to the left just a tad. That's it. Rest the ha hand on the throttle. Bring it to idle. And just start gently pulling back on the control column. Thirty. Bit more. 20, bit more. Bit more. Bit more. Ten. Perfect. Now bring the reverses up. That was a soft landing. All the way up. You want to get right into it. So I can let go of the yoke now. Yep. And you just want to use your rudder pedals to keep you in line with the runway. Bit of right pedal. That's it. And turn off the reverses. And we'll just let the aircraft roll to a stop. That was a good landing. That was very good. And when you're ready, set the parking brake. Yeah, then the little right. yep, and then the little lights by your left leg there. We'll turn them to the turn them on. That was good. Well done, mate. Thank you. Have you enjoyed that? Something a little bit different for you.